that we will walk through. Uh, where is it? There it is. Okay, can everybody see my screen? There's an agenda at the top. All right, thumbs up. Okay. Um, let me rearrange a little bit. Okay. So our agenda today is, uh, I'll start off with a regional overview from kind of the plan RVA perspective high up. Um, then we'll go to uh, Kristen and Henrico, and then we'll go to Grace in the city of Richmond. Okay. And I think that as a theme throughout this, you're going to be able to see that there are different types of projects and activities that contribute to water quality all across the region. There we go. Okay. Um, so improving water across the region. So we're gonna start with just a basic primer that I think will set us up for the rest of the, these presentations. What is water quality? Because if we're gonna talk about improving it, we should probably talk about what it is to begin with, right? Um, when you think of water quality, a real basic definition is just the suitability of the water. Um, is it suitable for certain uses? That could be um, aquatic life, the ability to sustain uh, aquatic life, be that little microscopic, teeny tiny um, organisms, or be that, you know, a tree, or be that that lives nearby, or be that large fauna, such as, you know, a bird or a deer or a bunny. Okay. But that also um, means public uses, so kind of human uses. Um, and when we think of the Clean Water Act, um, we think of the phrase fishable swimmable. And so that would be things like swimming, where people would be immersed in water, where they might breathe it in or potentially get it in their mouths. Um, and then fishing, can you, can you eat things out of that water? So what impairs water quality? Uh, well, pollution does. I think a lot of people know that term um, and know that it's not good, either for air or water. Um, so what is pollution? It's contamination of water bodies uh, by substances, substances, excuse me, or activities that make it unsuitable for humans or wildlife. Um, pollution can be many different things. Um, it can literally be litter. So objects that would flow into the water that don't belong there. Um, I have a few examples on this slide. Uh, so it can be, <laughs> the one closest to the center is something that we didn't used to talk about very much. <laughs> um, but re more recently, uh, over the past year or so, has become quite a topic of conversation. And that would be, our, um, well, face masks, uh, COVID related litter. Um, the, the one next to that is cigarette butts. Those are um, quite common form of litter, um, it, really disturbing. They are very small objects, but they amount to a large portion of what amounts to kind of physical litter. Um, please don't throw cigarette butts on the ground. They wash into waterways, they poison the water. Uh, birds pick them up and put them in their nests. Um, and then they're right by um, the eggs and the, the young. Please do not throw cigarette butts on the ground. The top picture is one, is a form of litter that actually goes up first. So balloons, balloon releasing. Um, I know it happens accidentally sometimes. It's not as much what I'm talking about, but um, balloons do go up and then they come down and they either get tangled in a tree, land on the land, and then they can wash into the waterways um, where they break, the plastic can break down or they can ensnare wildlife. Uh, bacteria pollute waters. I have a dog. I love dogs, um, but you need to pick up their poop. It's full of bacteria. Uh, maintain your septic system if you have one. A failed septic system or a, a poorly maintained septic system kind of spews bacteria into the watershed. Sediment can cloud the water right? It, the light can't get through, so it throws off the balance in the water. Um, I have a picture a little bit later in this presentation about, um, that, that I think will show what sediment can do as far as the 
water quality concern. Uh, nutrients, um, especially with regards to the Chesapeake Bay, we're thinking of nitrogen and phosphorus. When I think of nutrients, I think of fertilizer, um, but those can throw off an imbalance in the water. It can cause an algal bloom. It can, there are many different things that can kind of flow out of a nutrient imbalance in water. And of course, toxic chemicals, um, only rain down the drain. I think you probably heard of that. Um, paints, uh, chemicals in your garage do not belong in a stream or in a storm drain. Um, neither do oils, be it kind of a car oil or be it um, a cooking oil, do not dump those. Those, will, those also do not belong um, in our waterways. When we talk about pollution, how, if you didn't notice, all of that litter is sitting on the ground. It's not in the water. So is that a concern? It is because it's in a watershed and when it rains, it gets picked up and carried into the water. So a watershed is the land area that drains to a water body. They can be small or large. In fact, smaller watersheds, say a watershed for a stream, nests inside of a watershed for a larger body of water into which that stream may flow. Um, and you'll, I'll show you some maps in a little bit that shows how they nest. Plan RVA is located in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Um, it is a very large area. So let me see if my mouse, I don't know if you all can see my mouse. Um, here's Chesapeake Bay. Plan RVA is kind of down at the bottom in the James and then the, the top from the northern portion of Plan RV is the New York uh, watershed, but it does go all the way up into New York. So it's quite a big land area uh, that drains into the Chesapeake Bay. I don't think most people know how large an area it is. This is zoomed in just to Virginia. I think you can see things a little bit better on this map. Um, so again, here's the Plan RVA region. Uh, the yellow is the James River that kind of tan orangey color is the York. Um, so we do split between two watersheds. Um, just as an illustration, if a storm, you know, goes across this area, um, water that would fall in the York River watershed would not see water that falls into the James River watershed until it gets to the Chesapeake Bay. So, um, and then if you're curious, that dot, that dotted dashed red line, that is um, the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Everything south of that um, either drains kind of southwest or southeast, um, not into the Chesapeake Bay. This is a teaser, I'll talk about this uh, in a few minutes towards the end of this presentation. So, um, all these little blue lines that look like I'm taking weird cuts all across the region. Um, those are watersheds um, and you can get smaller. You can also obviously get bigger, um, but we are in the works of setting up a platform that people can learn more about their watershed address and about the watershed or the watersheds in which they live. So how can you protect water quality? Um, first, let me start with this picture. So this is a picture taken after, um, I think it was Tropical Storm Lee. It was one of the tropical storms that swept across um, the region um, back in, I wanna say it was 2011. And um, here is Richmond, here's the Chesapeake Bay. You'll notice most of the water is that kind of dark navy um, getting towards kind of a teal as it gets closer to a shore. If you look up at the top of the Chesapeake Bay, you see this large plume of brown, tan, I guess you would say, that is sediment coming down the Susquehanna River. So if you ever questioned if sediment really does pollute, yes, it absolutely does, and it can on a large scale. Um, so what can you do? Uh, there are best management practices or BMPs. Uh, both Kristen and Grace are going to talk about different BMPs. 
um, or forms of management practices um, in a few minutes. Uh, but best management practices are either they're a structure or an activity or an action or a behavior that um, people build or do uh, put in place, shall we say, uh, to protect water quality. Other things that you can do, you can pick up litter, um, pick up your pet waste, fertilize correctly, meaning um, do it at the right time of year. Don't over fertilize um, a lawn. Uh, proper septic system maintenance is important due to bacteria concerns. And then as I mentioned earlier, proper disposal of chemicals and oils. So I'm gonna to touch on a few plan RVA projects briefly, and then we will uh, segue into our other panelists. So Richmond Region um, Water Quality Planning Partners, this is the group um, of low quality staff, as well as staff from other organizations. We meet about four times a year. Um, its direct link is up to trying to improve water quality as it relates to the Chesapeake Bay TMDL or the Chesapeake Bay Water Quality kind of cleanup plan. Um, who's at the table? So low quality staff, as I mentioned, soil and water conservation district staff, state agencies, environmental nonprofits, uh, the Capital Region Land Conservancy, health departments, all of these groups have a role to play when we talk about water quality in the region. Um, so we collaborate and communicate about different programs or activities that could be going on um, either individually within these organizations or ways that we can work together or build off of each other. Don't trash Central Virginia. This is an anti-litter campaign that actually started a bit ago um, with litter managers coordinating um, and um, kind of keeping Rico beautiful, pushing it forward. But as it's become more of a regional campaign, um, it's found a home at Plan RVA. If you go to donttrashcentralva.org, um, you will go to a page on the Plan RVA website and you can learn uh, more about it. There is a general logo, Don't Trash Central Virginia, and it can be customized uh, for each locality or each, uh, we're also inviting partner organizations or businesses who want to join the campaign and support, you know, kind of a litter, an anti-litter crusade um, to join. We have uh, social media, Facebook uh, content, and then just general education content. Um, so keep an eye on that. We're doing some great stuff. Um, I'll mention a little bit more in a minute. I should also say on the litter front, uh, the point that Powhatan makes that I copied here, litter is, is, is a very costly uh, nuisance. So please don't litter. <laughs> uh, septic maintenance, we um, have been working on some septic maintenance content, both on the website, Plan RVA website, as well as these brochures. These are two kind of screenshots of what they look like. They're PDF brochures. Um, and we will be working on more this summer actually. So coming soon, um, a, water re a watershed resource platform um, that is in the works where people can learn more about their watershed. Um, we are participating in GIS and mapping updates along with the Bay program and they, um, mapping and land cover change that will go along with the Bay Cleanup Plan. Um, and then along with the Don't Trash um, campaign, we are working with stream cleanups. Um, we actually have one in the works right now. I believe it will be June 12th. Not all the details have been finalized. It is in coordinate cooperation with um, Keep Virginia Cozy and the Chickahominy Tribe. So watch our Facebook, uh, watch uh, Keep Virginia Cozy's Facebook and you'll see more details coming out soon. That should be great. And there'll be more in the future if you can't join us in June. So don't worry. All right, there is my contact information. Um, you can also find it on Plan RVA's website uh, under staff contacts. So let's stop now. Yeah, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. And 
think now we're going to segue to Kristen. So Kristen is going to looks like she, okay. Um, talk about a project in Henrico that will focus on the tributaries of the James or streams that lead into the James River. Um, and her project highlights some great work that Henrico County is undertaking to clean and protect our waterways. All right, Kristen, can you, you still have share screen ability and? I do, so let's see if I can get this to work. Thank you, Sarah. Mm. All right, can you all see that okay? Perfect. All right. All right, everyone, um, as I've said before, uh, first of all, Sarah, thanks for giving me this opportunity to share with everyone about our stream restoration program within Rico County. My name is Kristen Burton. I'm with the Public Works Department, Engineering and Environmental Services Division, and I am the Environmental Specialist for Stream Restoration and Construction Manager on site. So what we're gonna go over today is, um, first, of course, you know, what I'm gonna talk about is water quality and stream restoration. I'm gonna give you all a little bit of background, some water quality improvement techniques, you know, how stream restoration improves local water quality and the Bay. Then go over a couple of our Henrico County projects we've completed and how stream restoration can benefit everyone on a community level. So first, a little bit of background. In 2000, the county started the watershed restoration program to meet stormwater regulations and improve water quality on a local level. 440 miles of stream were evaluated. And of those evaluated streams, they were given a scoring system. And then we constructed about a mile of stream channel over the next five years. Then in 2015, the Chesapeake Bay TMDL was enacted across six different states and Washington, DC. Uh, as a lot of you know, the Chesapeake Bay TMDL or total maximum daily load is coined as a pollution diet that puts a cap on key, po key pollutants from entering to Chesapeake Bay. Those key pollutants are nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment, which uh, Sarah touched a little bit upon uh, earlier. In order to meet this pollution diet cap, the county has to reduce a certain amount of those key pollutants um, within a three permit cycle period. And uh, Henrico County is within the James. Um, watershed or river basin, which is highlighted in pink there in the map. So I give a, a very brief background on why and how we got into stream restoration. Now I want to talk to you about how stream restoration improves water quality and some design techniques that we use to improve the water, water quality. Um, I'd like to briefly go over what stream restoration is. It is essentially a time hop we go out and we find these streams that are in danger of being a direct source of pollution, um, safety risk, and are overall bad for the community and the environment. What we do is we design a system that puts the channel back into an equilibrium so the water can flow through the channel on a uh, as a stable function and eliminate a lot of that pollution source. One of the biggest main uh, sources of pollution in a stream is erosion from the stream itself, whether it be the banks or the bottom of the stream channel. Erosion in a stream or erosion in general um, is removal of dirt or um, channel materials over time via water movement and instability issues. Restoring these channels nearly eliminates this erosion problem. And uh, the first way I'm gonna tell you, got, talk to you all about is bank stabilization. It's the first technique um, that we usually address and the most broad source of our erosion and pollutant source. It's very common to see stream banks that resemble dirt cliffs, where the face of the bank is often vertical, no vegetation is on the banks, and the soil is completely exposed. Uh, you, this is a perfect example. You all can see the red arrow is pointing to those vertical cliffs. Again, barely any roots in the banks, no vegetation, loose soil, and as forceful water goes down this channel and travels through, the bank continues to lose or erode the soil, which is, again, a direct source of pollution. So this is the same picture of the same spot after uh, the restoration where we're working. This is the end of the restoration. So don't get confused when you look downstream that there's still that bank there. Um, this is as far as we were able to go with the restoration. 
But as you can see, the cliffs were removed, the banks have been sloped back, and that reduces, again, the sediment pollution and the phosphorus. Vegetation is also able to grow on these banks and adds further protection on a water quality standpoint. Fixing the banks also reconnects the channel back to a floodplain to reduce uh, nitrogen pollutant, but I'll discuss a little bit more about that later. The second technique I wanna to talk to you all about is realignment and stream bottom enhancement. Changing the shape or aligning the stream to give it curves to, mimble, to mimic natural channels helps control the water movement, which also decreases the pollution downstream and ultimately into the bay. The addition of cobble protects the bottom of the channel from removing soil vertically so the channel doesn't cut downward and become deeper. So just as I mentioned in the slide before, the erosion from the banks can make the channel wider, but you can also get erosion on the bottom that can make the channel deeper. And that's because, again, you have only exposed soil down there and no relief. So the cobble, in addition to protecting the stream on the bottom, also gives more oxygen to the water to improve water quality on a local level for fish and aquatic animals. So this before photo, you can see the channel is straight, it's narrow, dirt bottom. And when you get these heavy storm events, the water acts as a quick flume and it continues to remove the soil from the bottom, from the banks. Um, and also I have, this is another example of an eroded stream bank, as I showed you before, this one is seven to eight feet. This is the channel after restoration, same spot. Uh, the channel has natural curves to direct that flow, slow it down a little bit and pools to settle out pollution. That area, when you see in the picture that doesn't have cobble there, that's a pool. And those pools enable when the water sediment and pollution comes through, if it's at a base flow, some of that pollution can get settled out. And then you can see the cobble that's been added to the bottom for protection. And again, those big cliffs were removed and we're able to put to plant uh, vegetation on there. This, this uh, picture was right after construction, so we don't have a lot of vegetation growing yet, but can you can see how it's starting to uh, come in. The third technique I'm gonna talk to you about is actually one of, I think the, cooler, uh, the coolest techniques because we get to use material and actually build stuff um, within the channel and that is structure insulation. Almost every stream restoration project involves some type of structure insulation and these structures help protect the stream from erosion along the banks and the bottom, just like the cobble does and the bank uh, stabilization does. They're typically built using organic material or material found on site. And I'm gonna go over a couple of actual structure types with you in the next few slides. The first type of structures are ones that use imbricated rock and they are the most sturdy of the stream structures. Each one of those rocks can weigh up to two pounds. So you can see how much, they're very heavy, they're very large, um, they're not going anywhere, which is why we use them in the most high risk, steep, steepest areas of the channel. Um, they're used to build sills, rock sills, imbricated walls, rock veins across the channel to ensure the stream doesn't erode from the bottom. And the imbricated walls protect the banks from side erosion. Um, and as a reminder, that erosion is a direct source of pollution, which is what we are preventing um, so it does not enter the bay. That bigger picture on the left there, that's an imbricated wall. And then those two pictures on the right is a rock vein during construction and the rock vein after construction. And as you can see, it goes right across the channel and it keeps the water within the channel and away from the banks. And if for some reason you do get that deep erosion vertically, that rock, it stops where that rock is. So it doesn't go any farther upstream. The next structure type I'm gonna go over is with the use of more woody organic material. Um, log veins and log sills are very similar to the rock structures because they protect the channel vertically and horizontally. Um, however, we use material found on site. It's usually when the contractor has to clear the site to just restore the stream, they will save the woody debris and the logs to put back into the channel. Um, these are these structures are most commonly found in areas where the damage risk isn't as high as the rock structures. Usually, the channel is more flat. Uh, we still need them for protection, but um, the the risk areas aren't as prevalent. On that left there, you can see a log sill that is going into the ground before um, completion. Middle is a log sill. And the last one is a log vein. And as you can see, it's protecting that bank from rolling the water over the log and putting, pushing that water back into the middle of the channel. 
The last structure I'm gonna talk about are brush toes. Uh, brush toes are installed to protect the outer bends of stream banks. On site logs and branches are also used um, for this type of structure and those branches and logs are anchored into the bank. As water flows around the turn, the brush breaks up the water speed and it also redirects that flow back into the center of the channel. Um, the brush is also very beneficial because it adds a habitat qual um, uh, aspect for fishes, reptiles, um, and other organisms. And those left two pictures, we've got two different types of brushes on the left, both performing the same function. And on the far right there is daring installation. So those are uh, some structure types. And I've got one more uh, restoration technique to talk to you about, about uh, water quality improvement. And that is floodplain reconnection and wetland creation. Cutting in a floodplain or creating wetlands are very essential to the healthy stream and they further remove pollutants. Floodplains and wetlands are essentially flat areas right outside the stream banks that provide relief from storm surges or when there's too much water for the stream to handle. So you get these big storms and usually the pictures I've shown you like in the one on the left, that water just goes, is going straight through. It can't get out, it doesn't have any relief. Um, but as you see on the picture on the right, now that water can access that floodplain, access, the, uh, access those wetlands too. The water is retained and re pollutants are removed through settling and other biological processes. We also plant native trees, um, shrubs and grasses to reestablish the previous community or even create a better one. So those are some uh, techniques that we use, design techniques to improve the water quality. It's important to know, uh, mention that when designing a, a stream channel back to equilibrium to function properly with the storms and the in, uh, increased erosion that we all, we have to take into consideration that all four of those techniques have to be designed, designed together to function properly together. But I wanna go over with you all a couple county projects. The first one I'm gonna go over is the one we're working on now and three that we've already completed. Uh, the county has completed nine stream projects since 2006, and we have another eight on the books over the next five to six years. We have restored approximately two miles so far, planted over 31,000 trees, shrubs, and grasses, and enhanced over 15 acres of habitat. The one we're working on now is our water reclamation facility located in the east end of the county. And this stream is a very important one because it enters directly into the James River. So restoring it is substantial water, has a substantial water quality benefit. Uh, some of these banks were nearly 20 feet of vertical exposed soil. You can see there on that left, that waterfall picture there, that waterfall, the top of that waterfall was the elevation of where the stream used to be um, and where we were restoring about a thousand feet down. So you can only imagine how much sediment um, pollution and uh, phosphorus has washed downstream into the James and into the Chesapeake Bay. So this channel is also one of our biggest systems that we've restored so far, and it includes structures such as rock veins, brush toes, and as you can see from those before and after pictures, we've also cutting down those banks, opening the channel up for relief. Another project we did was back in 2017. This is uh, near the Hungry Creek Middle School. It's our Duncroft Park and within actual, an actual park system of the county. This stream had exposed banks near disc golf paths and trails, which is very dangerous for park, the park community and for students. The channel was moved away from the recreational facilities and regraded to mitigate pollution sources. Stone stream crossings were also installed, which are shown in that fourth picture to um, aid in recreation uh, activities. And as you can see, we have three befores there and three afters of how much better the stream looks after restoration. Another project we've done was uh, our quarter mill apartments located off Parm Road. Uh, this channel was interesting because it was receiving power surges of stormwater from an upstream concrete channel for about 800 feet. So when we got storms, that concrete channel just rushed into the cha uh, into this existing channel right here that we restored. It was also threatening um, apartment property. As you can see in that third picture, it's very, very close to the fence and the uh, apartment structures. So here the slopes are fixed and a series of structures were installed to help slow down the forceful water from up that, that upstream concrete channel. Um, that includes a deep plunge pool, which you all can see in that bottom right picture, which is basically just a big deep pool lined with rocks and imbricated rocks. 
uh, like I had told, talked about before to help slow that water down. Cobble benches were also installed as seen in that second, uh, that second photo there to further protect the banks and add more oxygen to the channel. The last uh, project I wanna to talk to you all about is our Virginia Homes and Boys for Boys and Girls located off, located off West End. Uh, we had over 10 foot high eroding banks there. As you can see on that third picture, how, um, how little that man looks next to that big bank. It was pretty, pretty high up. Um, the old channel was filled and cut to connect with the natural floodplain as you all see in those after pictures. Um, and another benefit was this site was overcome with invasive bamboo. So the, a lot of that was uh, removed and replaced with native grasses, trees, and shrubs. So I've gone over a couple of projects that we've completed to date, but I'm sure a lot of you are wondering, that's great. We're improving the water quality locally and for the Bay, but what are some other ways that a stream restoration can benefit me, my community, and my neighborhood. So I wanna go over just a couple slides of that with you all. The first one is a habitat creation. So as we improve these streams, we slow the water down and we create basically pocket ecosystems for um, animals that weren't able to survive there before. Um, stabilizing the stream creates a home for fishes, insects, those fish and, and insects, they bring you know reptiles, waterfowl, duck as you can see here and it just improves overall ecosystem as a whole and the environment as a whole uh, which is a great opportunity for the county and for its residents another benefit is recreation and aesthetic value uh, that bottom picture there is of those stream crossing that stone crossing that i showed you uh, with, at duncroft park uh, that top picture is a trail that was installed right next to a stream restoration. The stream, this, this top picture on the left is a great example. This is a one that we did early on in 2013, where the trees and the grasses have actually grown up enough to where um, it's 100% stable and back to equilibrium. Um, it's also, we, we opened up, we plant live, live flowers and create essentially a common space that before wasn't there. We also have more projects in the future to do more, you know, near schools and parks to further enhance that recreation and aesthetic value. Another big one is a learning opportunity. Uh, we've done a couple restoration projects um, in parks and schools where we put up uh, not only trails, but informational signs um, and platforms. So People can learn about stream restoration, learn about the design techniques and components and why it's so important. Um, this is very advantageous, especially for school programs to learn a little bit more about water quality and being in the environment. I actually was taken to one of Henrico's uh, stream restoration projects in school to learn about it, and it was a great experience. So we will continue to do this, add those informational signs so the community can learn about it and they can watch the stream restoration grow over time. When we plant those trees, they're only about uh, two feet tall. So the community can watch and talk about how it improves over time, which is a great benefit. And finally, and I, what I think is one of the most important design features that helps the community is improve safety. So as you can see from those two before pictures there, um, that first one was from quarter mill that I talked about earlier. See how close it is to the fence and the existing structure, same with that second one, stream restoration removes this threat of um, infrastructure collapse while stabilizing the stream as well. Um, from the, uh, There's been a lot of other slides I've shown you that you guys have probably noticed how unsafe that looked. Uh, one of the ones I showed you was of a restoration we did just recently about six months ago where we had about eight foot um, incised or eroded banks where neighborhood children We'll get stuck down there and they'd have to walk the full 1500 feet to get out because they couldn't get out from the banks itself so restoration is a huge benefit on an improved safety aspect and it really helps to protect those local neighborhoods because as we get more water over time those streams are in need of help and we come in and, and try to protect not only um, the water quality aspect but also our residents as well 
Well, that is all I have for you all today. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the presentation and learned a little bit about stream restoration, how it benefits and what it does. Again, my name is Kristen Burton. That is my contact information there. And again, thanks, Sarah, for uh, giving me the opportunity. Yeah, thank you, Kristen. That was great. All right, now let's segue over to Grace of the City of Richmond. Um, so Grace is going to talk about some uh, technologically advanced work that the city is undertaking to clean water that flows directly into the James River. Um, so Grace, can you double check that you've got screen sharing ability? Yes, I'm gonna share my screen. You're good, okay. Can you see it? Yes, ma'am, yep. Oh, all right. Uh, first of all, thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Kristen. That was really interesting. Those streams look really good. Uh, uh, preserving and protecting the bay, part of that, a big part of that is going to be repairing and restoring uh, all the streams that are feeders to the James and the Rap and all the other Virginia rivers that then feed the bay. So good work, Henrico. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk to you about the combined sewer system in Richmond. Can you see that? What are you seeing now? <laughs> it looks like we well, it looked like we were seeing both. Um, it was like in prison interview. I think that's what it's called. Now are you seeing it full screen or are you seeing presenter view? Now I'm seeing still presenter view, but. Uh, <laughs> let me try one more thing. I'm trying to, I've had people get caught in this before. How's that? Yeah. Is that, is that just a slide? That's just a slide. Ooh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> So I can, I can discuss combined sewers, but I can't figure out uh, presentations. Anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about the past, the present, and the future of the combined sewer system, or the CSS, as we uh, like to abbreviate it, uh, in Richmond. So if you remember anything at all from this presentation, these are the things I want you to remember. Um, first of all, water quality is improving in Richmond and Central Virginia. Richmond has made significant strides over the past 50 years to improve water quality in and around uh, Richmond. But Lynchburg, Alexandria, and Richmond are all combined sewer cities in Virginia. 772 cities in the United States have combined sewer systems. That's both large cities like New York and Chicago and small areas like Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Uh, East and West Coast cities have combined sewer systems. And the solution to fix the problem will be and are expensive. Both federal and state funding will be necessary to completely fix this problem, not only for us, not only for Lynchburg, not only for Alexandria, but for all those 772 cities that are dealing with combined sewer pipes. So this is a map of Richmond. Uh, you will see a gray area and a green area. The gray area is what we refer to as the combined area or those parts of the city that still have combined sewer pipes and stormwater pipes. The green areas are completely separate, meaning when it rains, it goes to a storm sewer and then to a creek and then to the James River. Wastewater never mixes with sewer uh, stormwater and it goes directly to our wastewater plant. The orange circles are the active combined sewer outfalls and the little black circles are the outfalls that have been separated and or closed. So why would anybody build a combined sewer? It seems counterintuitive to us now. 
But when sewers were first being built, the biggest problem was in fact flooding. Um, so storm sewers were built first and wastewater was added later. Um, what used to be, what did people used to do? Well, they, they went out in, a, in an outhouse in their backyard on the farm and in the cities, they put everything into the gutter or a ditch. Um, so back in the early mid 1800s, London started building sewers. I believe they were the first. And uh, as they moved west, uh, cities like New York and Philadelphia and Richmond built these underground pipes that you can see here. So this is how they work. On the left, you'll see uh, what it looks like when it's not raining. So here's a house with the uh, wastewater coming into a big pipe that's got both storm or when it rains. Here's a storm sewer. Here's the waste pipe. They're both coming down to this big pipe here. In normal conditions, the flow is not big enough or large enough to get past this little dam here. So even a small rain will not overflow this dam right here. It will go straight out to, to the wastewater plant. And in fact, uh, when it rains, Richmond can treat up to 30 million gallons, um, up to 140 million gallons of combined dry weather and what we call wet weather flow. Anything above that or what goes above this dam right here does get discharged to the nearest water body, whether that's a river or a creek, uh, that's what happens. And you can see that on the right where the, the water is too much for the pipe to carry and out it goes. So this is a history. Uh, since 1970, the Clean Water Act was uh, amended in 1972, and we began our study of our system, what it would cost and what it would take to uh, work on it. Uh, in 10 years time, we built what, is, what we call the Shaco Retention Basin. It's located down uh, just across Dock Street from Shaco Bottom. And it can hold what we call the, the first flush or the, the first bit of stormwater that comes off the streets. Uh, usually uh, people consider that to be the most polluted. So we thought that would be the first place to start. Let's capture that. Now hold it in the Shaco retention basin until the plant can take more water. Uh, by 1990, uh, we had developed what we call a long-term control plan, or what is our plan to address the rest of the combined sewer outfalls. Uh, we have been working on sewer separation in Gillies and the north side and south side conveyance tunnels, or these are big eight, nine foot uh, tall pipes that carry and store uh, combined flow when it's raining. Uh, mid 2000s, we reevaluated that long term control plan. We built another tunnel uh, over by the water plant, the Hampton, what we call the Hampton McCloy Tunnel. It's big enough to actually drive a semi truck through. And then we began what we call the phase three or the ending of our uh, work on the combined sewer system. We replaced a couple of regulators in Gillies Creek. We did some more separation in Gillies Creek. Meanwhile, the Chesapeake Bay TMDL was passed in 2010 and we had we upgraded the wastewater plant to remove more phosphorus and more nitrogen uh, from our treated wastewater. Uh, spent a few years designing and building that. That was completed in 2013. Um, in 2020, uh, that included, a, a, uh, we did an upgrade for the plant to go to 140, I mentioned that before. Uh, on a normal dry day, we treat about 45 million gallons of wastewater. When it rains, we now can treat up to 140 million gallons. Um, so we upgraded our disinfection facility to treat that extra stormwater to kill bacteria before we passed it out to the James River again. In 2020, the General Assembly uh, got 
involved in combined sewers in Virginia, and they had previously directed the uh, city of Alexandria and the Alexandria Renew to address their combined sewer system. And the year after that, they asked Richmond to essentially speed it up, if you will. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So Sarah talked a little bit about water quality and what that means. And I just wanted to pass along some real world numbers here. Uh, what you're looking at is a screenshot from the James River Watch that is produced by the James River Association every year. They have folks who monitor uh, not only the James River, but some of the tributaries starting on in Lynchburg and all the way down to the Bay. So they bring their volunteers in, they train them how to do these quick uh, bacteria tests and then they report them. They do this, I think twice a week from Memorial Day to Labor Day and then they post the results. So you can go in and say, well, I'm going canoeing up uh, near Lynchburg. Let me see what the water quality looks like. You go to their website, you pull it up and you can see what the water quality is, uh, whether there was a high bacteria count or not. Um, so what you're looking at here is a summary uh, from 2019 and then the five year period before that and how many years they have studied at that particular pot. So you'll see it starts up in Buckhannon at the boat race uh, ramp and ends down in Deep Creek in Newport News. And what I wanted to point out to you was the Richmond region. So they start at Huguenot Flatwater at the western edge of the city and go to Rockets Landing, uh, which is on east of downtown. And you can see the results from 2013 to 2018 were anywhere from 64% passing, meaning the bacteria met the standard for people to get in the river and swim to 91%. And then 2019 results showed an improvement over all of these locations. So generally speaking, the water quality in Richmond is pretty good. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. So how are we improving our system? One of the things we've done since 2018, uh, before actually the General Assembly asked us to speed things up, was invest in actual meters out in our system. So instead of a passive system where whatever flows into the system, we take at the wastewater plant until we've reached our capacity there, and then everything else goes out into the river. What we realized we needed was eyes on the system. So we installed upwards of, I think, a dozen or two meters, actual flow meters in the pipes with radio transmitters that we could remotely uh, zoom into and see what was actually going on in that pipe at any given time as well as meters on each of the outflows so we could tell when they were in fact actually discharging. Previously, what we would report to citizens and to DEQ are modeled results. So we would, you know, we have this fancy model that tells us when it rains, how much overflow we get at each point. And we decided to go with a real world measuring system. So we know exactly how much water is coming out of each pipe and when it uh, is actually discharging. So what you'll see here is a map of the city. The uh, blue dots are rain gauges. So again, before what we would do is take the rain at the uh, Richmond airport, which was the closest um, certified rain. And then we would assume if it's raining at the airport, it's raining in Richmond, therefore this is what's going out of our system. Well, as we all know, it can rain very differently around Richmond. North side can get rain, but south side won't. The west side can get rain, but the east side won't. It's not at all um, similar. So we put all these extra rain gauges throughout the city so we know where it rains, when it rains, and how much it rains. Uh, then we put in flow meters and what we call level sensors, which just tells you how much of a pipe is filled. So it measures the distance from the top of the water to the top of the pipe. 
And, and we learned a lot from this system. It's been very, very helpful and informative to us as we understand our system and how to get the best results of controlling overflows in the future. So what you're looking at here is the schematic of what that looks like. So this is what our collection system looks like if an engineer would draw it. So this blue line right here is the river. Oops. This is the south side. This is Shaco right here. This is Gillies Creek over here. And this is the north side. So it starts all the way over in the west end. Here's Bryan Park up here, Bacon's Quarter, Cannon Creek, all of these pipes feed into Shaco, which is right here, and then cross the river into the wastewater plant right here. So all of the green triangles represent a combined sewer overflow point. So at any given time, we can go in and look at what is the exact condition and capacity in our pipe system. So that's been very helpful to us. So Senate Bill 1064 um, asked the city to do two things. They said, by July of 2021, which is coming up shortly, identify projects that we can begin construction in a year and complete in five years um, to, to, to jumpstart this program, if you will. Then they said, for the rest of the combined system, we'll give you till 2024 to get the plan finished start construction in 2025 and finish construction in 2035. At the same time, uh, both, uh, both presenters talked about the TMDL. We have a bacteria TMDL, not just a Chesapeake Bay TMDL in Richmond and that plan uh, is due 2030. So all of that is regulatory driven. So that plan that we uh, have finished and will submit to DEQ by July 1st will involve 10 projects that will use existing capacity in our system. I mentioned before, we have a pipe as big that you can drive a truck through. So that pipe will be used for storage, what we call inline storage. So it already exists and will hold the water in that pipe until the plant can take more flow. So there's several places throughout Richmond where we have capacity, whether we need to build a little storage pipe underneath it, or we have existing pipe capacity. Those are the projects that we will do first. And they will involve valves and controls and you know all of that sort of stuff. It's not like we don't have to build anything, we do. Um, but this is what we are calling the interim plan. And the metrics of the interim plan are that those 10 projects will reduce overflow volume by 182 million gallons. It will mean we move closer to compliance with water quality standards for bacteria in the James by 4% and that we uh, increase co compliance with the uh, STV or statistical threshold value um, of 21.4%. That will cost us 18 cents a gallon or around $33 million. Uh, by comparison, what was currently in our existing long-term control plan would cost us 82 cents per gallon and give us lower compliance with the, both the geomean and the STV. Um, so what, one of the requirements in the interim plan was that we compare our existing regulatory requirement with what we came up with the new plan. And what this shows you is that this new technology, these meters and using the existing infrastructure is both cheaper and better than what we would have built 15 years ago when the long-term control plan was developed. So it, it allowed us to, to use better technology 
to get better compliance at a cheaper cost. So we think that's a win-win-win. So in conclusion, water quality is improving in the James. Richmond has been working on this problem uh, for 50 years. We have already spent $350 million and hopefully uh, with the infrastructure bills being talked about in Washington and Virginia, uh, federal and state contributions will help us get to that finish line. Uh, and we look forward to that. And that is the end of my presentation. Awesome. I'm going to try to figure out how to stop sharing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Grace. That You're was welcome. that was fascinating. I am always in um, captivated by how technologically advanced and fascinating sewers are. Um, yes. So, and I don't say that facetiously. If you want to. Um, find an interesting, there are books that have been written about sewer systems in various old, older cities across the globe. And it's, it's I know, and there's a guy on Twitter I follow who posts photos of old brick sewers, and you'd be surprised how interested people are in that. Really? <laughs> yeah, they're super beautiful. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I do have a bit of a closing statement. Um, do we have, are there any questions like q and I don't see anything in the chat. If you've got something, you can drop it in there. Or I think you can raise your hand and we can somehow allow, whoops. Allow, um, well, how do I go? Okay, I blew up my chat box. Okay, um, I'll just give it a minute in case anybody wants to drop something in. But Kristen and Grace, thank you. Those are fabulous presentations. I think that um, the work that the localities in this region are doing is absolutely, it's, in, it's incredible and it's extremely important um, and it benefits all of us. Um, and it can serve as great kind of role model examples for what, what can be done in today's day and age with improving water quality. All right, I don't see any hands raised and I don't see any Q&A in the chat or Q questions. Um, so we did, we're a little bit over three, which is fine. We started a little late. Um, so I'm gonna pause ever so slightly and then I think I'm gonna go on with the um, a bit of a closing statement and we'll say thank you and call it a day. All right. So we are very thankful to our speakers uh, who have taken the time to share with us today um, and for all of our listeners, uh, to our commissioners, staff, and community leaders, thank you for taking your time today um, to be with us and for your, any questions that you might have as a follow-up. Um, your involvement and leadership are what's making this region better every day. As a reminder, this webinar was streamed live on YouTube. Um, and it's available for viewing anytime on our YouTube channel. So if you haven't already subscribed, make your way over to www.youtube.com slash PlanRVA um, and hit the subscribe button. And you can see uh, our entire playlist of past episodes of this webinar series, as well as our other public meetings um, and events. So. Thank you very much, everyone, and we will see you next time. All right. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good day.